20 years ago, I was in the desert safari in Dubai with a friend of mine, Eddie, and we were riding in the back seat of the car. There was a man who was Arab who was driving. He spoke no English and I spoke no Arabic, so we're getting lost in translation. And it's like what they call in drama, the illusion of the first time. And you feel like you're, you're actually there in an Indiana Jones story. There are camels off to the side of the road, nothing but sand dunes. It wasn't the fly Dubai that you have now. It was, we're out in the desert, in the middle of nowhere, in a desert safari. We're getting lost in translation. The music that was playing, you know, and this is not making light of it, but it was the closest thing sounded. And that's what you want to hear when you're on a desert safari in Dubai with camels off the side of the road away from civilization. I was loving it. And the man finally looked at me. He got three words out of understand. He said, you like music? I said, yes, I like music. And he took that CD out and he put in cash money click, y'all. So here I am, Desert Safari in Dubai with camels off to the side of the road, riding on sand dunes to every time I come around your corner, bling, bling. It was the year 2000. We laughed about it, my friend and I, but the moment that our laughter subsided, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me very clear, clearly. And he said, there are people that sit in studios the size of this stage that send frequencies across the globe that literally shape culture as we know it. Back then, many people didn't even know the place existed, yet they were, they were shaping it, they were, they were forming it. You go down the street, the drag in Dubai, and they're young, rich 16-year-olds. It's like a wealthy Crenshaw. When it was popping. Look at your neighbor, tell them when it was popping. When, when it was popping. It's like a wealthy Crenshaw. You see guys with a gangster lean, arm out of the window, Rolex, draped with diamonds. And with a, for real, a gangster lean. Some of them never have been to Los Angeles. But the Lord spoke to me and said, while we're trying to get everyone into the church in order to shift culture, and there will always be a place for church. I'm not one of those that says it's all outside of the four walls. No, you live out there. You need some four walls from time to time. Holler back at your boy if you believe that God still has a place for the gathered to worship collectively. But the reality is we need to be able to seamlessly go between temple and marketplace because God is God of all the earth, not simply our church services. The Lord spoke to us and said that entertainment in many respects, like never before, was for us the next mission field. And God's begin to do things along the way. People misunderstand it. They don't have clarity always about it, and I used to try to appease everyone. I was the child that kept peace in the household. I tried to make everyone understand me. But I realized trying to get the crowd always to understand you, you will abort sometimes your purpose, your mission. You will dilute the thing that God has called you to. There comes a day where you say, Lord, I heard from you. And we've got to go after this with everything in our heart. Now, I promise you, I'm coming to where you are in a moment. The Bible declares, Jesus says, what is this present generation like? What shall it be compared to? He says, it's like children calling to one another in the marketplace. Listen. It says, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. And we sang a dirge for you and you did not weep. He said, John the Baptist came fasting and abstaining and you said that he was demon-possessed. He said, Jesus, I, the Son of Man, came. And you said that I'm a glutton, that means a person who eats too much, and a drunkard. So the same crowd looks at both Jesus and John and says, we're not feeling them. And interesting, because Jesus and John, in many respects, in their disposition, were polar opposites. John lived out in the wilderness and was weird. 
If you have a weird Christian friend, just look at your neighbor. Tell him there's a place for you in the kingdom of God. He has a purpose for you. You know, I used to look at those people like, you know, you know those weird saints, you know, the Lord is moving. It's like, listen, I'm not going to judge. There may be some power in your... It scares some folks off, but it's going to deliver somebody. Amen. John the Baptist was weird. He, he, he dressed up and he didn't have designer clothes. He dressed up in, in animal skin. He didn't eat fine meals, but he ate locusts and honey. All right. Bugs. Honey dip bugs. The crowd looked at his purpose and said, He's crazy. He's demon possessed. Jesus says, all right, my style's completely different. Jesus did not go to the wilderness. Please forgive the paraphrase, but I can argue you theologically and I'll win. Jesus comes out of the wilderness and starts his earthly ministry and he says, this is the Wayne Cheney Jr. translation. Jesus said, where the party at? You want to argue? His first miracle. He was not performing the wedding. He did not do the vows. He went to the after party for his first miracle. And he did not make grape juice. He did not keep the Kool-Aid flowing. He, first miracle, water, to wine. Now put that in your religious pipe and go smoke it. Water to wine. And it's implied that the party was already going real good. Most scholars believe that most people were already, you know, um, filled. Because it says the custom was that after they've had their fill, you would bring out the cheap wine after they couldn't tell anymore, which means they already had some. Jesus, after it, the party's fully going, comes, turns water to wine, does his first miracle there. John the Baptist is out in the wilderness. Jesus says, I'm going to where people are. I'm going to where it's happening. I'm going to the spot. Now, this is not a word for everybody. If you're clean and sober for two weeks, that is not your ministry. We'll find something for you to do in here. Don't, you don't have the club ministry to serve the drinks. Not wise. But listen to me, John abstained, he disappeared. Jesus went to where the people are. He lived or he dwelled in the townships. He went and ministered there. John the Baptist was always fasting away from where everyone was, abstaining. The Bible says that Jesus came and he had feast among people. He was with them. They were, John the Baptist was a voice crying out in the wilderness. Jesus was the incarnate presence in city centers or, or villages as he would go. What am I trying to tell you? He said the same crowd, the same group of people that demonized John are demonizing me and we're polar opposites. He says, we played a flute for you, and you did not dance. There was no external response. We sang a dirge, a funeral song for you, and you did not cry. There was no external response, and there was no internal touch between me and John in our ministry to you. What was he trying to show us? He was trying to show us the insanity of always playing to the crowd. Because if you're always playing to the crowd, if you're always playing for the approval of people, if you're always looking to be celebrated by everyone else, you will miss your assignment. Because your first step in your assignment, often there's no one to go with you. And sometimes when you go a little bit further, there's some early adopters, but some other folks looking at you saying it's crazy. We don't like it. This is not where the church should be. But I'm here to tell you, I'm tired of playing to the crowd. Are you still here with me? Because the crowd, 
that demonized the one that was fasting also demonized the one that was feasting. The, fa- the crowd that demonized the one that was out in the wilderness also demonized the one that was at the party. The crowd that also demonized the one that was abstaining demonized the one that was partaking. So Jesus was saying, if you manipulate your disposition constantly for the crowd, you will never do what it is God called you to do. Why am I saying this? Because God said, today I sent some world changers in this place. I sent some people with the unusual anointing that don't do it like it's been done before, but believe that God has called them just like he's called their grandmother and their grandfather. God's raised them up just like he raised the person up that used to sing the song we all rocked to growing up years ago. God says, listen to me. And I'm done, almost. You didn't think I could do it, but I did. That's what happens when you don't look at your notes. Got to try this more often. But here's the idea. Listen. He says wisdom, the passage goes on and we're done, to say wisdom is vindicated by the fruit that she bears. In other words, as you're trying to obey God, people will always misunderstand you. And I know we have some visitors, but I want to talk to Antioch real quick. We're going into some unchartered territory. We're going after harvest that no one else is looking for right now. Are you with me? We're going to do some unusual things. We're grounded by the word of God. We believe scripture just for all of the critics. Are you still here with me? We believe scripture so well that we believe we should get out of our comfort zones. We should go where no one else is going. We should attempt the unusual but biblical as led by the Spirit to reach folks. Listen to me. And we're going to some unusual territory. Please hear my heart on this. But we have to keep on walking. For some of you in this place, God has brought you into this house for such a time as this. It's been difficult for your gift, your talent, your ability, or for the way God gave it to you to be celebrated by others. You've been frustrated. You've you've struggled. God brought you to this place because we believe as long as it doesn't violate the word of God and the spirit of God, we believe in celebrating you and turning you loose because there's somebody somewhere waiting to receive the presence of God through a vessel that is wired just like you. And you've been trying to fit in. You've been trying to, to blend in with everyone else in order to be accepted Jesus says that's insanity because no matter how you morph or dumb down your call no matter how you neuter what I've given you people will still think that you're crazy people will still talk about you so you may as well do what it is God has called you to do I need a few radical people who say I'm tired I'm tired of diluting my call I'm tired of dumbing this thing down I know I have a word from God I know I heard from him they're not celebrating with me now but the same people that were standing against me I'm doing it for them because they have no idea that this is what God is up to Bible says wisdom is vindicated by the fruit she bears in other words keep walking look at your neighbor tell them keep walking Yeah, I know your call's crazy, but keep walking. I know you have audacious faith, but keep walking. I know it seems confusing right now, but keep walking. They may not be celebrating with you, but keep walking. Because the day will come where wisdom will be proven by what you produce. Are you still here with me? Touch somebody, tell them, I'm not just walking, I'm producing some things. You can't see it right now, but it's like a woman who's pregnant. You don't see the baby, but in a matter of time, what I've been carrying on the inside, I'm going to touch with my hands. What I've been carrying on the inside, you're gonna, we're going to see with our eyes. God's getting ready to manifest the thing that I've been carrying, and everybody's going to celebrate. They weren't there for the pain. They weren't there for the labor pains. They weren't there for the morning sickness. They weren't there when I had to push this thing out with nobody but a prayer partner holding my hand. But when I birth this, everybody's going to celebrate what God is doing on the inside. Hallelujah. 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 Just prophesy to somebody real quick. Tell them, keep walking. So they'll see. Yeah, it doesn't look like it now. They'll see. Uh Uh-huh. Keep walking. 
I got to go. Last point. But I, what do you do or what does God do when he's put something in you that he's called you to that people don't celebrate and that people attack? Ask Paul. He was the one that used to persecute Christians. God raised him up and said, I'm going to use you as the voice to touch those to even lead some of those that you persecuted and to bring people into my kingdom. Why? I've got to do an unusual thing. He said, I need someone who is trained outside of the camp, on the backside of the wilderness in Arabia. I don't want it to look like anything else because there's a call to some Gentiles, some people that are not in the faith. They don't have the same customs we have. They don't do it like we do it, but they're my children and I need to bring them home. So I need to raise up somebody that has learned from me, from hearing my voice on the backside of the wilderness, that has not been influenced necessarily by all of the other movement, but I'm going to raise you up. Notice this. The Bible says that the other apostles were suspicious of him when he came. And I want to pray for some of you that have a unique call and we're done. The Bible says they were suspicious of him because they heard about his past. Now, this is not a parallel to Brother Kanye. It works. But I'm talking to somebody out here. People are suspicious of you saying God's called me to something because it looks different or suspicious because you have a background. There's some skeletons in your closet. Look at your neighbor. Tell them you got some bodies on you. But notice this. Paul said, I'm going to meet these other apostles. I'm going to meet the religious community. And when he walked in there confident about who he was, because he knew what God told him, the Bible says, when they recognized the grace that was on my life, they had to give me the right hand of fellowship and say, he doesn't do it like us. He has a different message. He's called to a different group. But yeah, I can tell that anointing is the same. He's one of us. I'm talking to some folks out there that feel like you're in the kingdom but outside of the camp. Who am I talking to? You feel like you're in the kingdom, like you know you're a child of God, but you feel like an outsider looking in because of the unique thing that God's called you to. Just throw your hands in the air and wave them at me real quick so I know I'm in the right place. Here's what God sent me to declare to you. Sin was represented in the Old Testament by leprosy. And if someone had leprosy, they could not dwell amongst people that did not have leprosy. So they were banished outside of the camp. But every now and then someone was healed of their chronic sin. I mean, excuse me, their chronic leprosy, their condition. But they couldn't just run back up into the town and say, guys, I'm healed by God. But they would have to sin for the priest. The priest would go from the temple. They would take off their priestly garments, come down to where the people were, put on their natural garments, their everyday clothes, and would walk into the camp to inspect the leprous person to see if they were healed. If in fact they were healed, they would take blood and they would put blood on their forehead, their right ear, their thumb, and their big toe. Then they would take oil, put oil on their forehead, on their right ear, on their big thumb, and on their big toe. Then, when they went back into the camp, people who knew they were sick would know that they were healed and they had been with the priest. Not because they inspected them, but as they came from a distance, they would see blood and they would see oil. Let me see if I can help you, I'm done. The Bible declares that while we were yet sinners, while we were still in our condition, while we were far from God, while we were ostracized from the community of faith, 
The Bible says he who knew no sin became sin for us. He took off of his, his glory that he had with the Father and clothed his glory in normal, everyday human clothes. In other words, he did not keep the same Shekinah glory that he had when he was with the Father, but he clothed himself in humanity so that he could come down and walk amongst us to be where we are. Is there anybody glad that's glad God didn't wait for him to get cleaned up, but he came and saw about you while you were still messed up. He said, came and saw about you, you when you were still tearing up the club in the middle of you being high and drunk. God came to see about you. If you're glad about it, praise the Lord that he came to see about you. And the Bible declares, God, I feel like celebrating. It declares that if he just sent you back into the crowd, people will continue to bring up your past. And they'll be skeptical because of who you used to be. But the same way the priest put the blood and the oil, the Bible declares that the blood of Christ covers us from every sin, past, present, and future that our sins are covered by the with the shedding of blood there is the forgiveness of sin so every time the enemy reminds us who we used to be i have to look back at him and say oh uh, that the the, the the scene of the crime is erased because there's blood there when you go back and look at the scene of the crime look at somebody tell them there's nothing but the blood yeah but here's what i love bible says the second thing he does is he puts oil say oil which represents the holy spirit bible says that when you have an unusual call and when people cannot receive you often based on your journey what god will do god i love his word he'll put his oil on you he'll put his anointing on you he will cause his spirit to overshadow you so that when people see you stand they'll look at you and say i know them i went to high school with them i went to college with them but i don't know who that is they have the same name they have the same facial features but when i look at them there's something overshadowing them it's the anointing of the living god and God has sent me in this place to declare that there's some people with an unusual gift and you're waiting for the crowd to recognize it. God says, don't wait for the crowd to recognize it before you step out into your call. He said, all you need is the blood and the oil. The blood shows that you're forgiven for everything that you've done. But the oil is letting everybody know that my hand is on your life. Life. Look at somebody tell me that's all I need. I, I almost gave up. I almost walked away. But when I step back in there, they're going to see the hand of the living God on my life. We're done. Listen. But if you're in this place and you have an unusual call, God sent you into this house on an unusual Sunday to begin to activate all that he's given you and even though he's given you unusual call it is not generally detached from a faith community doesn't have to be this place but you need to find a house where the purpose of the Lord on your life is celebrated but what I want to do before we dismiss is I want to pray for everyone you may not have shared this with your family your friends but you know you have an unusual call you know God gave it to you. It was like me 20 years ago. We're on 15th and Gundry with 175 members. The Lord said, I'm going to call you into territory that I've shown you. I'm going to bring you into this space. That's going to be one that influences culture. Listen to me. And I want you to hear me. Not by me being the face. I want you to really hear me. 
I just went ahead to scout the land as a spy to come back and let you know that there's fruit on the other side of these giants. God said, it's not going to be you who's going to be the face of all this. He said, you're going to let them know it's possible to dream, that it's possible to believe that it is God who's saying there's more than just having a job at the church but there's some territory in the world that we're called to take there there's some righteous politics that needs to happen there some righteous entertainment god wants that for the kingdom of the living god there are some projects that your friends are laughing at you about but i've called you to it god says you're gonna pray some prayers and you're gonna sow into people who step into that territory like never before and drive out darkness you don't have to think about that but if you know that shoe I need you to come bum rush this altar I'm gonna pray a prayer of blessing and release over your life and I'm believing God to accelerate your destiny don't wait for people to understand you don't wait for it to make sense to everybody God says just start walking and my blood is gonna cover your past my anointing my spirit will overshadow you and give you favor when they try to close doors on you come on come on Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, yeah, God's going to do it. He's 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 going to do it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you're not the, the ordinary tribe. The Lord sent you in this place today to let you know you're not crazy. You feel like an outsider looking in. But whenever God wants to revolutionize the camp, he brings somebody from outside of the camp to revolutionize the camp. When there was fear in Israel, God found a shepherd boy tending sheep by the name of David who said, I may not look qualified on the outside, but while everyone is running away, I'm charging in. Give me my sling. Give me my stone. I'm taking down the stuff. Everybody else, if I die, I die, but I'm not going to die on my knees. I'm going to die challenging this culture of fear. I'm not going to be passive. I'm not going to be that Christian that hides in a corner. I want the world to know that we serve the true and the living God. And when I step back in that environment, I'm expecting things to shift. When God wants to revolutionize the crowd, he brings somebody from outside of the crowd. He brought John the Baptist. When God wants to revolutionize the crowd, he brings somebody from outside the crowd. He brings Paul, who has an unusual ministry. And I believe that this service today was about those of you that have gathered around this altar. So we're going to just pray a quick prayer. It's already begun with the acknowledgement that, Lord, you have given me something. They may not see it yet, but it will be celebrated. And, Lord, it's good enough for me just to be faithful with the call you've given me. If my name's never in lights, if I'm never in the newspaper, God, I just want to be faithful to the call. I don't want to be anybody else. The world is waiting on what you've given me. And so now, Father, in the name of Jesus, just lift your hands. I thank you for these who have gathered today. It is no mistake, no accident. You've ordered their steps to this place. We celebrate all that you're doing in their lives. Lord, I pray that this serves as confirmation that they have been hearing you, that you did speak, that there is something unusual, not the ordinary, that, that you've called them to. Now I pray, Father God, that your voice becomes clearer and more prominent than any other voice in their life. I pray that like your son Jesus and like John the Baptist, they're able to drown out the voices of the crowds and allow your divine utterance, your holy word, written and spoken to be what orders their steps. May we have a singularity of purpose like your son Jesus Christ who declared, I only do what I see my Father do in heaven. So it is your desire that we align ourselves to. Lord, give us the boldness to step out. With this unusual call, we believe that it's you. 
We know that we know in part and prophesy in part. We see bits and pieces of the picture, but it is our faith that allows us to cross the chasms of uncertainty. It is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. And so now, Lord, we respond with a yes. Where you send us, we will go. We don't change our disposition, our strategy, or our unique fingerprint because of the prominence of someone else's call. You did not call Jesus to be a voice crying out in the wilderness, nor did you call John to seek and to save that which was lost. Lord, speak the word of identity into us, clarity of purpose. As we yield ourselves to you, may we become a mighty force, not only individually, but corporately and collectively. Lord, as you bring us into the territory you desire to shine your light in. And it's in no other name, but the name that is above every name. The name that requires every knee to bow, every tongue to confess. It's in the great name of Jesus the Christ we pray and believe this to be done and all of God's children who believe he'll do it let me hear you shout amen 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 amen